please everyone join me in welcoming Chris Sander. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Phillips and, and, and Cindy. Uh, 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 I mean, Phillips has put, put together an amazing uh, set of uh, uh, conferences that I watched uh, you know, at an earlier stage. And it's, 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 it's great to see how you've done that expertly. Uh, and one quick comment to, to, to Jason in terms of, you talked about uh, fitting the, uh, the infrastructure to the question. Uh, when we do science, it's the other way, other way around. Whatever computer is available, we'll do our algorithms, we tailor them so that we can actually get something done and not wait for next year's computing. So it's a back and forth, actually. And I'll come back to that a bit later. What I'd like to tell you about today is research that's done in the context of a very interdis inter interdisciplinary setting. I work at a, 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 a cancer center, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. So there are others like that, uh, MD Anderson in Houston. There's Dana Farber in Boston. And they're often linked to universities uh, locally here to Harvard Medical School, Harvard University, MIT. In, um, in New York, Memorial Sloan Kettering Center has across the street Cornell, a branch of Cornell University, Rockefeller University actually have appointments at these. And so it's a back and forth between basic science and applications. And uh, the kind of applications that I want to tell you about are solving, using basic science, some aspects uh, of, 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 of healthcare, uh, the cancer problem. Uh, the caveat is that if you wanted to solve the cancer problem in a major way, uh, or make, make a large impact on it, the best thing to do is number one, eliminate cigarettes completely and go to Indonesia and make sure that Indonesians don't now ramp up uh, and, and, and China and so cigarette consumption. The other one is prevention. So my personal advice to you, other than watching what's happening in cancer research perhaps, is to actually take care of your health, prevention. The immune system is hugely important. And, and the analog of the recent successes in cancer treatment, which is stimulation of the immune system, especially drugs and compounds and antibodies that, 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 that unblock the immune system, has, that has an analog in your personal lives, which is the personal health that actually strengthens the immune system to be able to fight the cancer before it even arises. But after it arises, uh, the, and, uh, and I'll show you, uh, after, it, after it arises, there's a, there's a, there's a major uh, good news, bad news. The good news is that targeted therapies have done amazingly well since about the year 2000, with Gleevec being the poster child of that, it was in the cover of Time magazine, of actually addressing the particular genetic alteration, uh, in that case, bcr able a fusion protein that's illicitly brought together by genomic alterations, and then hugely uh, uh, upregulates large production of a, of a protein tyrosine kinase. It does a certain reaction that promotes growth. And the drug, given the knowledge of this uh, illicit genetic alteration was targeted uh, to this protein and did an amazing job of curing people, at least transiently. In fact, in that case, quite well, but there was always, there was always relapse. Fast forward a few years ago, amazing success in melanoma. Genetic studies show that there's a particular, again, a protein molecule called a protein kinase that does, does a chemical reaction on, on other proteins by putting phosphor groups on them, so-called protein kinases. And in melanoma, about half or 40% or so have a mutation in one particular position, B600E, you know, one particular position in the genome that then leads, contributes strongly to cancer. A few years later, uh, drug companies developed uh, inhibitors that target the RAF kinase and uh, amazing success. I'm not showing you the pictures now because they're actually not that interesting but you had people who had melanoma all over their body, got this drug, and, uh, and the melanoma disappeared. They went back to work, and they celebrated, and so on. And for most of them, and this is really the sad part of it, about six, eight, 12 months later, melanoma came back, and, and the tumor had become resistant uh, to that wonderful drug. So the question now is, from the, from, the, from the practical point of view, develop new drugs that solve the problem, and taking a step back, and looking at what we do, which is uh, analyzing the biological systems from the point of view of, of, of a complete picture of the whole genome, all proteins, but also from the point of view of looking at cells and collection of cells and organs as a system, sometimes called systems biology, we asked ourselves, well, what do we, what do, we do in order to avoid this game of having 
a drug and then resistance, another drug and then resistance, another drug, another resistance. We just heard a talk yesterday at the AACR in, in, in lung cancer. There's something called ALK, another kind of protein targeted. They give the drug, there's a mutation. They give another drug that's even better, they get a mutation. And they have done this now three or four times. That's an endless game. Well, maybe not entirely, but it's a very difficult game. So what we asked ourselves is can we intervene in this robust system of cells uh, that, that are able, these cancer cells, that are able to escape the targeted intervention uh, and adjust, can we go in and prevent the resistance of emergence in the first place? And imagine you have a complicated system. This could be a financial system. This could be an engineering system uh, that seems to be escaping the perturbation that you apply in some way. Uh, uh, there may be, even though it's a quite a robust system that's quite adapted, if you put enough blocks, you may be able to block it in and prevent the emergence of resistance. So the idea is to use more than one drug, maybe two or even more than two, and block the exits before the cancer escapes. And that's what we call combination therapy. Now, to do that, uh, you can just, if you, if you have a big pharma company, you can go and just take pairs of compounds in the right kind of assay, meaning experiment, where you test the effect of drugs on growth. And uh, you can just spend a lot of money and do, go, through, to go, go, through, go through a million compounds, single compounds. If you want to do pairs, a million times a million, is, uh, that would be too expensive, actually. You can see the point that they're doing, uh, developing combination therapy experimentally, while possible, becomes very expensive, especially if you, if you go beyond two drugs. So we decided to use some of the methods we've developed in computational cell biology and see whether or not we could do this computationally. And this requires knowledge, computational knowledge, a computational representation of what those cells are doing. Uh, and so you have to capture the biology, put it in a computational model, make it executable in a way that's actually predictive. And that's the story that I want to tell you in the first part, and then uh, two other things. Now, the way I've designed, put, uh, put this together is, uh, and this is actually not working here, the counter. Uh, the, 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 way, the way I've put this together is in three stages. Number one, basic discovery of what combinations of drugs to use, and what do we do to do that using perturbation biology. The second one is to take a look at the tens of thousands of cancer patients that are currently being profiled in terms of the gen the genetic alteration of the molecules in the clinic and learn from all those patients who've donated their samples and who've been, who've been sequenced and, and, and otherwise measured in terms of the tumor samples, learn from those to see what we can do to design better clinical trials to test out these drug combinations and also the single drugs. And then third, what would we do from the computational point of view and the, uh, the point of view of, of organizing information to actually roll this out in clinical practice where physicians increasingly starting now, but you know, five, six, seven years from now, it'll be really main, mainstream, will take the genomic profile of the cancer, dip into the information system, uh, assisted uh, very strongly by, by, by computation, and then make decisions for that particular patient that actually have a much higher chance of working than just having the one pill for all. And this, of course, what's called precision medicine, and, uh, and uh, uh, Barack Obama and, and, and uh, uh, leaders at the NIH, like Francis Collins and Harold Varmus, eloquently described this. And you might have watched the news a few, uh, a month or two ago. And hopefully, the funds will also flow. But it depends on the political process in Washington. So what we can do is make a contribution here to show how we can get from here to there in terms of making the basic discoveries, designing clinical trials, and then rolling this, this out in clinical practice. And I'll give, just a, give you a flavor of how we do that. And uh, so, so, so basic discovery, back to the system of cells, cancer cells, and how they, uh, how they react to perturbations. And let's try to capture that computationally in a way that's actually genuinely quantitative and predictive, not just pictures on a page of a journal. So the cycle here that I'm describing is, uh, the, the, is, 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 the, uh, is it showing? Yeah, it is showing. Uh, uh, you design experiments. Uh, you then take measurements in the laboratory, in the cellular system. Uh, you build models, computational models, representing what those cells are doing. And then you use predictions, basing, using those models to actually sh pre to predict computationally, going through lots and lots of drug combinations, shown two, two of them or more, what would be the combination 
of drugs, what would be the effect of the combination of drugs on, what the, uh, on the growth of the cancer or the de -differenti differentiation. And you can do this several times around the circle, going back to experiment, redesigning new experiments, uh, doing, uh, doing those experiments, uh, if refining the models, until you're satisfied that you have something predictive. And if something interesting arises, you go to the laboratory. And in cell lines, uh, which are cells in the laboratory, in dishes, or in mice, which have human tumors implanted in them, called xenografts, uh, or ultimately clinical trials, you then try out uh, uh, to see whether those drugs are actually working. Now, perturbation biology, uh, the reason I call it that is, is really an analogy to physics. What's perturbation physics? Well, there it is, linear hadron collider. Uh, you do massive repeated experiments. You perturb, perturb, perturb the system, <laughs> which is in these tunnels, particles smashing together, and then you observe using lots and lots of measurements. Uh, and then based on that, you do computation, not shown here, and you find whatever you find computationally, you predict or you, you verify, in this case, the Higgs boson. So perturbation biology is just a small scale analog of that. Rich perturbation, repeated perturbation done systematically, rich observation of the outcome of those perturbation, and then lots of computation, not as much as actually is used at the LHC to make inferences. To do that, you have to have a right kind of mathematical model, uh, some representation, and this is the art. You can get it wrong. In this case, we used upper right network models, where basically the, you have entities which are connected in a network through interactions, uh, and the entities, these little circles here, what are they? They are concentrations of protein molecules, changed protein molecules that are, that are phosphorylated. This is important for the signaling. Uh, the, targeted, the targets of the drugs that are coming in from the inside and the observations, the output of the system, which is whether the cells are growing or going into, into, into cell death or, 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 or re-differentiating. So each of those nodes is a scalar variable, x sub i, where I goes from 1 to 100, 200, 300, and they represent molecular measurements, but also aspects of cell physiology. And it's very important to have a simple mathematical model that captures this in such a way that you can represent the microscopic individual molecules as well as the outcome that matters, which is whether the cells are growing or dying. And so we put this into a mathematical framework uh, that captures this transition from microscopic to macroscopic by choosing the variables intelligently and choosing the variables in this system differential equation in such a way that they actually represent, represent something, number one, that's measurable, and number two, that's of interest in terms of the prediction. And of course, those variables have to be chosen with some idea in mind of what, the cell can, what those cells are doing uh, and what are the perturbations that are coming in that you systematically choose, for example, small molecules that target these proteins, uh, and then what the cell does in terms of the, 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 the responses, the messenger the RNAs, the proteins, the phosphorylated proteins, and then what's happening at the level of the cell. Are they growing? Are they dying? Uh, and so these are the variables. So you have to understand the basic biology to pick the right variables. Like in any system, engineering, you have to do the same thing. Then you have to find the right mathematical representation. You could get it wrong. There are all kinds of models. This is not, networks are not the reality of biology. They're models that describe biology. And then apply. If you're successful, you get good models that actually describe uh, the experiments and can extrapolate beyond them in the predictive sense. You can use them in a variety of ways. You can predict computationally uh, running your software that represents a system the results of unseen perturbation, drugs you've never tried, perturbations you've never applied, genetic alterations that you haven't observed yet, and what would be the effect on the system. Or you can just go back to your biologist friends, of course we're also biologists, and interpret, describe what's actually happening in the cells, which, the interpretation, the mechanism of what's happening in cells, the subject of every other paper in biological journals. Or you can ask yourself, what perturbation would I have to apply in order to get downstream the right kind of effect? I want those cells to go away and die. I want them to redifferentiate so they're no longer like stem cells. And then you, you can use that same system to design perturbations that have the desired effect. That's the goal. That's the ambition. Now, let me show you how that works. Now, the idea of perturbation biology isn't actually new. Molecular biology, which arose in whatever, the 70s or 80s, has always done perturbations. And here are the things that used to be really, really hot and cool way back then, blots, where you can see individual molecules on bands. Now that's old fashioned. <laughs> But there are thousands and thousands of papers where you, they made small perturbations in cells and then a small number of observations using these gels and then 
drawing a diagram, a network model that isn't quantitative, isn't computational, but represents the summarized biological knowledge on page three of the biological paper. And this has been a revolution. Well, that was 30 years, 40 years ago. And so how can you do better? Well, you can do it to larger scale. You can still do these kinds of experiments. You have to think harder to then come up with a kind of, the right kind of models. Or you can go to a larger system, and now it gets difficult. You use chips to make the same kind of observations. These are a thousand different cellular, cellular, compo uh, cell, uh, cellular, cellular experiments on each of these chips, and each chip is interrogated by an antibody. Uh, and then you have to use computation because you know, the, the, the gray matter deduction that molecular biology has been great at for the last 30 or 40 years just no longer works. And, uh, and so you use computational representation to actually derive these network models, and be that becomes a major challenge. And this, of course, not just about compute, apologies to, to Jason and others, but you have to do thinking along the way. No insult intended, of course, you guys think very hard to get your cycles up and running you know, for a few hours, 50,000 cores, and then they come down again, and you have solved the problem if you have the right software. And the software really comes from, from thinking, and also the thinking process comes in to, to interpret the results of the large computation. So we need those brains, and that's why we have computational science in a biomedical setting. OK, so perturbation biology, to get like the linear hadron collider all the way to the Higgs boson, you perturb systematically, you measure the outcome, you infer those network models that are quantitative and predictive. You run those models with unseen perturbations, or you design drugs that actually have the desired effect. And then you have to go to the lab to test this. Otherwise, no biologist will leave you, and no clinical trial will be approved if you, if you don't test it. And so, so let's take an example here. We take melanoma. That's the one I'll talk about. Also liposarcoma, which is a fat, a fat tumor. You take cellular material that's like the tumors. They're cell lines, they're called. You put them in a dish, and you do perturbation experiments, uh, an analogy to what you would do in patients, except this is just doable in a laboratory in a dish. And you do measurements on these chips that we initially adapted, we did with uh, Gordon Mills at MD Anders, and now we have our own machine that, uh, called ZeptoSense that's actually uh, 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 a lower throughput but a higher accuracy. And so we do the kind of experiments that I showed you with the, on those gels on the previous slides, uh, and uh, we do something like 150,000 of those. Uh, and so now you're talking real data. It's not huge data, but, uh, but it's, 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 it's large on the, for, for the scale of biology. And so now to solve the problem of now deriving the network models, you need, you need sufficient data. And number two, you need the right kind of mathematical methodology to actually to deduce those networks. And we've developed this technology over the last five or six years, which are called perturbation biology. The first one is this system uh, that, uh, that, that takes the cellular material and does chip-based uh, analysis. Basically, the result in the end is measurements of proteins and phosphorylated altered proteins in several hundred experiments, when each experiment you've, if you've perturbed the cells, you've ground them up and put them on these chips. That's the technology that we've adapted, not invented, but adapted. And it's much better than those, uh, those old-fashioned gels, which were great at the time. The sensitivity is about ten to, uh, four, four or five orders of magnitude better. So we can really go down, even to clinical material, where you take a biopsy from somebody, a small amount of material, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and to those measurements. Here are 150 protein measured in about 1,000 different experiments. So this is not something you could have done before uh, if you didn't have this, this, this chip-based technology. And there's more to come with mass spectrometry. Uh, and so now, the second part of the technology is to now use that data set that I just showed you and now derive the network models. Uh, and uh, and that, that's a hard problem. Now these, let me show you briefly what those network, network models are. Uh, these are the variables I described, proteins, phosphoproteins, uh, uh, targeted uh, perturbed by drugs, cellular outcomes, and the differential equation to describe the time behavior, at least ideally. In the first approximation, we just set the time derivative to zero, steady state that corresponds to letting those drugs sit in this, in this cell culture for three days, and after three days, the cells have pretty much adapted, have gone to some kind of a steady state. So we match those two, experiment and prediction. And the differential equations basically have an interaction matrix, WIJ. If you have 100 proteins, it's 100 by 100, 10,000 numbers to describe who interacts with whom. Now, how do you get those 10,000 numbers? Well, it's very hard if you want to start from scratch. 
So, so uh, and, and by the way, these are slightly nonlinear. This function f is a sigmoid function that actually keeps the system stable. And so to derive now the right kind of parameters, WIJ, that matrix of 100 by 100 for 100 proteins, to, to do that, which you can write as a, as a matrix or you can write it as a network, uh, uh, or you can write it as a model that has all those variables in it and measures to what extent experiment fits prediction or prediction fits experiment, which is this term in the optimization function. And secondly, you want to keep things simple. If you have too many parameters, you have 10,000 numbers and only 2,000 experiments, well, forget it. So you don't want to overfit. So you have to reduce the number of parameters. In statistics, you do something like regularization. And uh, in, 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 in this physical analogy we use here, we have a simplicity term. There's a penalty for having the model to be too complicated. So you optimize, given the data, this matrix WIJ, the interaction, such that, number one, the experiment, the, the agreement between experiment and prediction is, 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 is optimal, and secondly, with a certain weight, that the model is as simple as possible. That's all. Now, to do that, uh, however, you'd have to go through a very, very large number of, uh, take, take a system of 25, not 125. The matrix of the action is 25 squared. That's 625. If each one is one bit that can be on or off, that's 2 to the 625. Do the numbers. The solution space is huge. Now, no, no AWS cloud will, uh, will, will, will be able to go through that. You have to have first a clever way of actually representing that. And we borrowed that from statistical physics, beta and piles, and others later, a probability method called belief propagation. This is not the Kansas City Board of Education that believes something, but this is belief means actually, belief means pro a probability that's approximate that gets evolved when confronted with the data. So rather than, given the data, going through lots and lots and lots of different matrices W or J that describe what's interacting in the system one by one using something like Monte Carlo, instead we derive a matrix of not single numbers, but probability distributions over those single numbers in a set of good solutions. And then once you have that, if you can do it, then you can instantiate individual uh, network models that you can execute and run. That's all. Uh, hard to develop because you have to make certain approximations. You have to large, large, large uh, sums have to be represented by, by, by integrals, and you have to iterate this in the right way. You basically ask your model, which is, which is this, this thing here, uh, you ask your model, what would you predict for a certain experiment called the factor? And then you go back in the next cycle and say, what does the experiment now tell you in terms of how to best adjust the model? And you do this in cavities that go around the system. You gradually tweak and tweak and tweak. And this is developed initially by, by statistical physicists. We learned this from Ricardo Zacchina and colleagues in Torino. Uh, and it's also been used in statistics uh, for, to solve a number in computer science to solve a number of very hard problems that would be very hard to solve by going through individual solutions, but deriving probability distributions uh, 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 over a set of good solutions and then instantiating individual solutions actually works. And so let me show you now, you iterate this until it converges, and that's the heavy computation part. Uh, and now let's see how we apply that to a real system. Melanoma, uh, here are the drugs we use. Uh, each of these lines is an experiment, perturbation of one or two drugs, and this is their observation. In this case, about 10,000 data points, and we have about 250 possible interactions, 100 nodes. This is now not the whole cell, but it's a part of the cell, making the assumption that everything else is a background. We choose the variable such we think that we've got captured the main essence and also correspond to what's doable in experiment. Okay, fast forward. We now derive based on that limited data set in these cell lines derived from melanoma, the skin cancer. We derive these matrices. And here are the probable distributions for each of these edges, in uh, positive or negative. Uh, and here's a network representation of what that looks like in terms of, that looks like something you have on page four of a review paper in a biological, uh, biological journal, but this is actually derived from the data uh, and it's quantitative and it can be simulated uh, forward in time. Uh, and so let's do that. Let's now take some of those instantiated models uh, that come, that, 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 that come from, from, from the data, go through probability distribution and that are individual models and now let's execute those. Uh, 
maybe a maybe thousand or so. These are all very good models with low error and quite simple, and see what they predict about what. Well, so the stack of models, let's say here's some proteins and their interactions. This is a made up example just to illustrate. Say you come up with one drug. Now you can actually ask your, your computational representation what happens if I, if I perturb, uh, perturb this, uh, 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 this protein, and what's the effect downstream in this network that describes the data in melanoma cell lines that we've measured. And you run this to completion to steady state in this case. Uh, and here's the prediction that says the following protein, polokinase 1, tends to be negative in the probable distribution, tends to be negative in its effect on what? In this case, cell proliferation. So if we take the, an inhibitor, a drug, an inhibitor of polokinase, which is a protein that's in the cell cycle, it will have a strong effect on the proliferation of those cells. This comes out of the computation that's driven by those 10,000 data points. Now let's go and see, uh, go to the lab, and now take that drug that we hadn't used in the experiment, put it in those cell lines, and now you do the cell count as a function of concentration, oops, concentration of the drug. And if you know your, your basic chemistry, nanomolar is very good, meaning you need a very, very, very small amount of this drug to actually have an effect on those cells, and they just go away and die. And these cells are actually resistant quite resistant to this RAF inhibitor that I told you before that was very, very successful in the clinic and where those patients after a year or so get resistance. So the suggestion here is that this particular inhibitor or combinations with that, with that first one, the RAF inhibitor, they actually might have a positive effect in melanoma. It otherwise, it's resistant to the single drug. This hasn't gone into the clinic, but I'll show you one that has a higher, a higher chance of getting into the clinic. Uh, the first, this polokinase one has some toxicity problems, uh, borderline. Now let's take two drugs, do the same thing. Take the system of equations derived on these data sets and now simulate that. This hadn't been tried before. We went through all kinds of combinations, tens of thousands of different combinations of drugs, and ranked them by which of the two drugs, the two drugs in combination that have the best effect on, 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 on growth, using the same kind of data sets. And this network is then used to make the prediction uh, interesting biology uh, in these uh, uh, that, that could guide experiment, but the main point is we can execute quantitatively and predict the best combinations in these melanoma cell lines if these models are correct. And here are the, the two best combinations, which is either inhibit a protein called RAF, inhibit the protein called MEC that's actually a sort of close, uh, is downstream of it in the signaling cascade, together with this other one, called MYC, which is a famous oncogene. Uh, and this, 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 this plot shows you what the, what the drug effect is, the fact that it's a strong effect, and it's, uh, that the effect of the two drugs is synergistic. The sum is more than the, uh, the, the, the effect of the two is more than just taking each individually and adding up the effects. It's a synergistic effect. And so now, so we tried this in the laboratory. Uh, the art was to find something that actually deals with this oncogene C MYC. Uh, that's a whole chemistry story. Uh, but Jay Braden actually here at Dana-Farber and Harvard Medical School has actually developed a drug called JQ1 that does something close to inhibiting this oncogene MYC. So we combine that drug uh, as predicted uh, uh, with the inhibitor, the other two inhibitors, and shown in this graph here, which is the cell response relative to the concentration, that if you use the two drugs together, the curve response curve shifts to lower values, meaning you get away with less Combinations. So number one, the combination is effective. Number two, it's 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 actually it's it, it's more effective than each each alone added up. Uh, beyond that, actually, not shown in these experiments, you have the opportunity to go back to the original discussion that I that I, uh, the the fact I told you about. What you're starting to do, uh, not only do you have a have a synergistic combination, but you're actually starting to block the exits. One exit is blocked. Now this is second exit block. So beyond this experiment, this may actually indicate how you might be able to, to, to prevent the emergence of resistance. And these are experiments that, that are in progress. And we're discussing with clinicians of whether or not we can move this forward into the clinic and also working on a number of other ones. This one is in, in, in the D-differentiated leprosarcoma. Uh, we published this in, uh, in, in journals to make it available and also make the software available. And now applying this, and this will take some time, but it's exciting as an option to different kinds, more and more melanoma and these other different tumor types where we have material in the laboratory and we have drugs that we can use in, use in combination to first interrogate the system, like in the LHC in Geneva, 
and then based on those experiments, derive the computational models and make the predictions that allow us in collaboration with clinicians to then gradually evolve combinations, initially two, and subsequently we'll do more than two, at least try, to see whether or not we can actually make a contribution to blocking uh, the, the emergence of resistance in cancer, which is uh, one of the key problems in terms of uh, preventing the progression to a more aggressive disease. And so that, 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 that is the discovery part uh, that I wanted to describe to you. It's obviously a work in progress. Nothing of what I told you about has actually made it into the clinic, but, uh, but there's a process by which we tend, tend to do that. And this kind of methodology, which uses you know, some statistical physics, some insight into what those cells are doing, and uh, medium-heavy computation uh, and makes a contribution that's complementary to what big, big Pharma might be doing with, uh, with large-scale uh, screening experiments. This is not the only effort, obviously, but it's a contribution that comes from uh, computational and systems biology. Now, if you want to now apply this in a, in, a, in, a, in a clinical setting, obviously you can do all kinds of experiments you want in mice, but in the, to go into the clinic, uh, to do experiments uh, on human beings, uh, we don't do experiments, but you do clinical trials, uh, which is a kind of experiment that is highly controlled. Uh, and so how do you now design clinical trials to seize this opportunity? What you have to know is not just you know, what drugs might work in a particular setting, but you also want to know uh, what is the particular genetic constellation of the particular patient material that the, that the patient has donated for this investigation. Uh, and to do that, uh, you have to, you're faced with a tremendous problem, which is an incredible diversity of, uh, of genetic alterations in different tumors. We first saw this in the Cancer Genome Atlas in glioblastoma, aggressive form of brain cancer. Uh, you know that Ted Kennedy uh, suffered from that. Uh, that, that. That even though the patients in glioblastoma all look fairly similar in terms of their clinical, man, uh, their clinical progression, when you actually take the material out and you do the sequencing, and the measurement of the messenger RNAs and the proteins and so on, they are very, very different one from another. It's like in computer, in, 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 in software development and computation, you may have uh, a specification, the company says, okay, build me an ATM machine, and different software engineers will find different solutions. The phenotype of the ATM will be the same roughly, but the solution, the implementation in the software will be different from one hand to another. So similarly in cancer, different types of glioblastoma look the same clinically more or less, but the implementation that, that can, those cancer cells have found given genomic instability are quite different. So you have to, but to, to address this specifically, individualized to one patient, you actually have to know quite a bit about the individual solution as well as the generality of the phenotype. That's the challenge. And so this has been addressed in a large network called the Cancer Genome Atlas, which has now gone on uh, for five or six years. We've been heavily involved here, all the tumor types that have been looked at. Uh, and this is, this is uh, you know, funded by the, by, the, by, the, by, the, by the National Cancer Institute and, uh, and NHGRI, another NIH institute. Fantastic insight into the molecular diversity of genetic alterations and other molecular measurements in tumors. We're now, and there's an international project called the, uh, the, the this is the, the US national one, there's an international one called the ICGC. And so we've summarized this uh, in, a, in the CBIO portal for cancer genomics, about 20,000 individual donated tumor samples from patients that have been analyzed in this way across, across uh, about 20 or uh, 25 different tumor types uh, in about 100 different studies. This tells us now what is the landscape. And now let's look at that landscape of alterations and see whether they can group uh, patients together into groups that might be suitable clinical trials. We can't do a clinical trial for each of these individuals that are all different in implementation, but we can group them together uh, by patterns of alteration. And so these, we've done a clustering analysis focusing on a subset of the data that we know from biological intuition is the most important in terms of oncogenesis. Uh, and this is the exercise. Uh, of actually simplifying the, in, in, in the original measurements, which are about 60,000 measurements per tumor sample across these different tumor types, simplified them down to what might be the in, most interesting, biologically interesting events. And then in, in clustering, uh, my postdoc, Johnny Ciriello, wrote that clustering algorithm, uh, uh, which is uh, and, uh, also the kind of algorithm used in social sciences that groups together patients into groups that have certain kinds of alterations that might be clinically relevant. Uh, and find, number one, that there's, there are some tumors that are mostly dominated by mutations, 
and some of them are mostly dominated by copy number alterations. Uh, tongue and cheek, we call this is hyperbola of, of cancer alterations. This gives, gives an indication of what some of the processes are and how to address them. And here, a complicated diagram that tells you of these 3,000, in this case, 3,000 cancer patients grouped into different subgroups of what are the typical alterations in terms of the most interesting protein changes, genetic changes, and what are the pathways, the groups of connected genes that are most important, and how might you drug them. And then taking those patients, grouping them together, each of these boxes is about maybe 50 to 100 patients that share, to some level of approximation, genetic alterations. And this is the personalized medicine that cancer biology is now rapidly developing in something called basket trials, where people are put, put together based on the genomic profiles. You have to be able to measure this in the clinic from the original tumor sample before you can assign the patients to these clinical trials. But you can, and this is rapidly developing now, initially typically with single drugs and two drugs. We hope in the future it'll be also more than two. And so we're going to assist, we're in the process of assisting with this information analysis of these 20,000 tumor samples and rising, uh, assist clinicians to design clinical trials. Uh, and now, putting this into the hands of physicians who don't want to bother with bioinformatics and, 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 and computational biology, uh, you, uh, uh, we've developed an information system that sits on top, if, in a sense, of a pyramid of information with lots and lots of contribution from many, many people, and we've, we've, we've summarized the information derived from this Cancer Genome Atlas project and put it in the hands of, uh, of, of oncologists, of biologists, who just want to know what's happening in these tumor samples without going through large amounts of data sets. And the CBIO portal for cancer genomics, which was developed in my research group at Memorial Sun Kettering Cancer Center, uh, with the key developers being Nikki Schultz, who now heads his own group there, and uh, Ethan Sarami uh, as key developers. Uh, now there's a team of about 10 people working on this, and we're expanding this now to completely open, to be completely open source with other institutions and other groups contributing. This has been a, is now used by thousands of researchers. Uh, we've got the Google Analytics uh, record to show that, by thousands of researchers uh, to interrogate this rich data sets in ways that if I had time, I could give you a live demo. This is absolutely fascinating, looking at individual tumor samples and seeing what are the genes that are changed, what are the mutations. Is the mutation in RAS or PR3 kinase? Is there a deletion of, of TP53? Uh, is RB deleted or not? And what is the potential effect on the tumor phenotype? And what does it, does, how does this guide us in choosing therapy? Uh, existing therapy and then therapy which are currently being developed in clinical trials as I, as I indicated. Or survival outcomes based on certain markers, biomarkers in these tumors. And you can you actually go into this, if you know a little bit of biology, and say, okay, if I now look at something that has these alterations, each one of these columns is a tumor sample, if I just aggregate these, then, oh, the ones that have these alterations, the tumor samples, uh, actually, though some of them have a better or less, uh, less good outcome, this is survival as a function of time. You can do these kinds of things interactively. I encourage you to try it out. Go to cbioportal.org. And this is now developing rapidly to a situation where not only do we have genomics and molecular measurements, but we also uh, go down, drilling down. This is one patient. This is an information page about one patient. The genome left to right, this is the entire genome with its alterations, mutations, and, and changes in DNA, little snippets of DNA that are amplified or moved around. And this is three different time points uh, in the meta metastatic samples. And you can now see, begin to see the progression of these tumors. And what's the molecular incarnation of the progression in one patient and all the different mutations and DNA changes down to the level of individual nucleotides in the genome, one out of three billion base pairs. And so now we're actually seeing the intricacy of what happens in tumors. There's lots of challenges still. All right, so this is something that, uh, that uh, 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 we're moving forward and putting this into the hands of clinicians. Let me just give you, uh, in, 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 in three minutes, and then I'll leave you a little bit of room for discussion, uh, one other, uh, one other um, uh, important development in computational uh, biology uh, which is related to what I just talked about, but it's a very basic science. You want to know what are the shapes of these proteins so you can develop drug, drugs against them. And I don't know if I can see a show of hands, who of you have actually taken a sort of basic molecular biology course? Okay, that's quite a few. So you've heard about 
uh, the problem of going from an amino acid sequence, and here's a list of those shown, to a protein 3D structure. And this is an un has been an unsolved problem for the last 40 years. I will just show you briefly how we've now solved this problem uh, for initially a small number of proteins, and it's rapidly rising. And it's one of the most exciting developments uh, that, that I've been involved in uh, 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 with Deborah Marx at Harvard Medical School and our uh, 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 friends in, in, in statistical physics in Torino, uh, Ricardo Zakina, Martin Weicht. And this is now an exploding area. The basic idea is that if proteins in a protein, you have a contact between two residues, that what happens is that in the amino acid sequence, there's a correlation of mutations. You make a change in the protein, and then because the protein has to maintain its shape as a system, any adjacent uh, protein polymer unit has to change as well. And you can see this in the genetic record, in the fossil record across different species. Now that the art is to turn this around, now that we have so many sequences, to take the correlation, the correlated mutations, and derive distance constraints. And then if you have enough distance constraints, you can actually put them on this polymer chain computationally and run molecular dynamics, which is a fairly heavy computation, but that's well established, and you can fold out these proteins successfully. So we can now actually go from amino acid sequence to the 3D structure of proteins successfully in, in quite a number of cases. I'll show you one example here. We use a statistical physics uh, uh, method called maximum entropy, which solves the key problem in going from correlation to causation. Uh, and uh, it actually looks similar to the, the, the physical physics, I, I, you know, it's a Hamiltonian and the probability model. You might see, know that. And here's the example of an experimental uh, structure and a predicted structure. No, it's actually the other way around. So uh, they're so s close, these predicted structures, uh, at this cartoon level to the experimental structure that we've eff effectively solved this. All the, all the pieces are in the right place. This only works, however, currently for about 2 to 3% of all proteins, but rapidly rising as we improve the methodology and as we get more and more sequences. And so the interaction map of a different kind using these methods uh, uh, without the maximum entropy formulation and with the maximum entropy formulation get much better. Red on gray means accurately predicted. And so we're applying this to uh, predict proteins, membrane proteins that are very hard to solve uh, experimentally, the 3D structure of those. We predicted in a blind fashion, published about 15 of those in 2012. Four of those have now been solved by crystallographers and they're, uh, they're essentially correct with one small exception where the helix is turned the wrong way. Last week, ad the adiponectin receptor, important in diabetes, came out and it's, 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 it's almost spot on, it's very good. So this is an, a way of, of using genetic information from all these new sequencing technologies and then lining them up, putting the, computing the constraints using the maximum entropy method, and then using structural biology in a computational incarnation and fold 3D structures. And this will accelerate the discovery of 3D structures as well as uh, all kinds of science based on it, evolutionary consideration, fitness, as well as potentially drug development and protein-protein interaction. Okay, with that, you can go to see this actually on evfold.org, which is our website in collaboration between the two institutions, Harvard Medical School and Memorial Sloan Cancer Center. I want to thank uh, the people who worked on perturbation biology, uh, especially heavy computation recently by Anil Korkut and our friends in Torino, uh, Joanne Cheriello, Nikki Schultz, who helped us, uh, who did uh, the work on analyzing that cancer genome atlas and summarizing this into groups of patients, uh, potentially, that can, can be uh, assigned to clinical trials. Uh, and the C. bioportal or cancer genomics, Nikki Schultz, Ethan Sarami, a whole other team, uh, to make cancer genomics available, uh, information available uh, to researchers on a day-to-day -day basis. And Deborah Marx and colleagues, and again, Torino uh, Statistical Physics, for the uh, solution, partial solution, of the protein folding problem. And I'll leave this slide up for a few minutes. Uh, the information services we provide in some of the area of cancer biology, as well as the basic computational biology of molecules. Perhaps we can do a few more questions. Thanks. <laughs>